very familiar text of Scripture. Where David, I believe, gives the secret, hallelujah, to his faith or his, his success in God, hallelujah. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually, somebody say continually, continually. be in my mouth. Be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Amen. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me out of, from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried unto the Lord and he delivered him. Out of all of his troubles. Hallelujah. Put your Bibles down. Let's raise our hands up today. And let's talk to God. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord God. We want to be like David of old, God. Bold in his faith in you, God. Bold in his trust in you, God. Hallelujah. Taking on challenges, Lord God. Because he knew that he had a God behind him. Have your way in touch today, Lord. As I speak to your people, yes, Lord, I pray for your anointing, God, yes, for the hour yes, to speak the words that you would have us say. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give God a hand. I'm praise you. As you and I'm going to preach to you this morning from this title. You've got to have a big God. Yes. You've got to have a big God. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. The 10,000 hour rule. In his book entitled The Outliers, They're Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell postulates this theory based upon a study by a psychologist, Dr. Anders Erickson, which states that 10,000 hours of deliberate practice is what is needed in order to become a world class master at any functional skill set needed to perform athletics, music, chess, or in any field. When psychologists talk about deliberate practice, this is what they mean. They mean practice that pushes your skill sets to the max. Deliberate practice is a mindful and highly structured form of learning by doing. Learning by doing. In 2014, a study conducted by Princeton poked considerable holes in this theory by finding that deliberate practice was not the only thing that was needed for top level proficiency in any given field. So what's the takeaway? The takeaway is this, that the 10,000 hour is applied most appropriately to the area of the formation of one's beliefs. I'm not sure if we can quantify the exact number of hours that are needed, but it has long been known that repetition ensconces or that means just imprints indelibly onto our mainframe, our computer, our hard drive. Praise God. What becomes our beliefs? What you practice is what you will believe. What you associate yourself with. What comes into your mind. What you feed on is what develops your beliefs. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher and scientist, commented on the role of repetition in learning by saying it's frequent repetition that produce, produces a natural tendency. As a skill is practiced or rehearsed over the days and weeks, and an activity becomes easier and easier while naturally forcing that skill into our subconscious level, where it becomes a permanently stored for recall and habitual and even default use at times. And what that's simply saying is this, that when you practice something over and over and over again, it comes to the place that it's second nature. Yes. You don't have to think about doing it. The way you drove here today, Amen. if you've done it a number of times, yes. you don't have to think about doing it. You're thinking about other things, as a matter of fact. Right. Those right. things are, right. are occupying your mind mm -hmm. on the top level or on the conscious level, and subconsciously, the route to church you just take. You yes. just do the terms. Amen. Another example is learning how to ride a bike. The more attempts a child makes, the more the brain reinforces the particular skills that are necessary to stay in balance and in motion simultaneously. Mm -hmm. 
Right. After some time, the child doesn't have to stop to think about each of those parts of those procedures that's necessary for him to stay upright, balanced, and in motion, or how to stop without falling off. Every time the child rides the bike, the skill is reinforced. Even years later, with no additional riding experience, it's possible for a person, having not ridden for a long time, to get on a bike and begin to ride once again. Because it was so firmly encoded into the brain. This is the power of learning by repetition. According to Michael Merzenich, author of the book, The Brain That Changes Itself, practicing a new habit under the right conditions can change hundreds of millions and possibly billions of connections between nerve cells and our neural pathways. The human brain is made up of an estimated 100 billion neurons, making a total of 100 trillion uh, neural connections. And what a neural connection is, is like for me to lift my arm up, it seems very simple to us on the outside, mm -hmm. but what's happening beneath the surface and in the brain, there are neural synapses. That's the message being sent from one neuron to another, you know, one nerve cell rather to another. And it's sending that message, it's traveling that route. And it travels a particular route to do a particular thing. So the more you repeat it, that's, that has, it has an automatic function. So that, that becomes a neural route. And what they say is by, by repetition, that neural route becomes ensconced in the brain. It becomes an automatic thing. You know, a, a function of our atomic system. We have some things, some activities in your body that you don't think about doing. Breathing. You don't think about breathing. It just automatically happens. It's an automated function in the body. It's something that automatically happens. Doctors have recognized this about the mind, and hence, however complex the operation, Sister Diane can probably say amen to this, they keep on encouraging the patient just before the operation. Right. They speak. As a matter of fact, when you're done with the operation, during the post-operative uh, period, visitors are not allowed in when that patient is, before they wake up, because as they're in that subconscious sleep or before they come back to, uh, to their conscious level, uh, they don't want anything negative to suggest anything because it will go into that patient's subconscious mind, thereby damaging what had ever been done to rectify the patient's state of health. So they're particular about that. They found this out. What you believe has been written subconsciously at your core. Yes, that's right. And it dictates to a large degree how you process and react on the conscious level to information that your senses receive. What we have repeated and affirmed most often is what we what forms the basis of our automatic response. Our automated response. Meaning, it's your autopilot mode. On autopilot, you're not pulling the levers, you're not turning the steering wheel. On autopilot mode, it's automatically being controlled by what's on the inside or what you truly believe at the core. And when life throws things your way, when things happen, Sometimes, when it's all of a sudden, when it's by surprise, when you weren't expecting it, your automated response is what comes to the surface. Praise God. When your conscious mind is overloaded by the data your senses is receiving, your subconscious autopilot mode kicks in. It's already doing other functions 24 hours, 7 days a week in autopilot mode, such as your breathing and your heart pumping through your body. But when things happen all of a sudden that you weren't expecting, that's when you go into autopilot mode. Right. Mm -hmm. Where are you truly at? What you truly believe is what comes to the surface. Praise God. It happens, yeah. and, and sometimes people are shocked by how they react. But it's what's been on the inside. Yes. Praise God. It's what you believe. It's it's. It's not, re it's, it's not something that you can even control sometimes. It's what comes to the surface. Yes. David, unbeknownst to his father, Jesse, or himself, was sent by God on an otherwise ordinary day to fight in a battle he did not prepare for in particular, but was totally equipped to handle. He was totally equipped to handle. It, it, really, it wasn't really his fight. 
And he was not even enlisted in the army, but he was the man God chose for the battle when everybody qualified in the army refused to fight. Mm -hmm. He saw the enemy and no one wanted to engage him when they saw the enemy. And David threw himself into the battle. He didn't need a long time to contemplate if he was going to accept the challenge. He decided immediately that there was a cause. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible doesn't introduce David at this point. Rather, in the previous chapter, we learned some interesting things about this clearly different thinker. After a series of rebellious actions by Saul, God rejects him and his lineage from being in the kingship of Israel. God introduces David in Scripture from one of the most obscure and most unlikely jobs, watching sheep. What a promotion. Chosen over his seven brothers to be the next king of Israel. But Saul had a malady, a mental malady from the Lord, stemming from his total disregard for God's instructions. God had given him this situation to buffet him. And David was needed. He needed somebody that had the anointing yes. of God. Mm -hmm. Somebody to help soothe what was going on on the inside of him. In choosing a person to do this, Saul's men made six observations about David. They came to Saul and they said, we know a man. And this is the thing they said about David. Now, he was only a herder of sheep. But look at the reputation he had as a herder of sheep. He is cunning in his plan. He was a skilled player of the harp and instruments. He's a mighty man, mighty valiant man. That's a warrior. Right. That's just a shepherd boy. Yeah. But he's known as a warrior. Yes. He's a man of war. He'd never fought a battle. Mm -hmm. He's prudent in matters. That means he's studious. He studies. He okay. trains himself. He puts his all into whatever he does. Right. And he's a comely person. That means he's handsome. And the most important thing, they said, the Lord is with him. Yes. You see, I, I, I'm convinced that some of these things that David had gone through, and he's going to mention later on, I think some of those things that people knew about, they heard about the stories, the lion and the bear. I think somebody else knew about that. Somebody else heard about it. Evidently, something was prompting these men to make this statement about this young shepherd boy. That's right, yeah. God chose David to be king because David had a big God mentality. Right. And I'm going to tell you, you have to have a big God mentality. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because when you have a big God mentality, no situation that you face yes. is going to get you to yes. a place that you cower in fear. Oh, Jesus. It might happen initially, but something shirts that off. Right, right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The faith yeah. inside of you, of yes. your big God, right. begins to make you push forward That's right. like David Amen. did. Hallelujah. God wanted this kind of leader, a man who spent his time in obscurity, on the backside or on a desert, watching sheep. Not really, that's not somewhere where you're in front of everybody. That's not in the city. You you take the sheep to a place where the grass is at. You keep going further because as they eat the grass, you got to get to a place where there's more grass. And it makes you go to places that are obscure. Nobody's really there watching you or knowing about what you're doing. But David spent his time filling his subconscious, his internal hard drive, with unshakable, unchallengeable reality of God's greatness and his superiority over all opposition. He praised God while he was there. He perfected praising God while he was in a place where nobody was at. And he put it to the test. Praise God. God made us with some incredible, hardly imaginable technology. Take a look at how he describes the function of the quintessential element of life. That he placed inside of man. Genesis 2 and 7 says. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Breath. Amen. Breath. Breath. Neshama. The, uh, the Hebrew word for breath. Is used 
two other times. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching the innermost parts of the belly. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Hallelujah. In other words, you might as well just say the camera of the Lord, recording everything that ever happens. Because the next verse in Ecclesiastes 12 and 7 says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. That's our flesh. And the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So he has a complete record of your life. Right. Dr. Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist, termed the spiritual part of the mind as a superconscious, which was directly connected to God. This is the invisible hard drive that God has placed within all of us that records everything you see, everything you say, everything you experience throughout your entire life. It doesn't make judgment. It just simply records right, amen. everything for later retrieval or for default instructions when you're forced into default mode. Meaning that this hard drive just soaks in all the information. And see, you can, you, can, you can influence, you can manipulate that hard drive that's within you. You have the ability to manipulate that. You have the ability to put some things there. You have the ability to put some things on the inside. You have the ability to write some things on the core of who you are. You have the ability to do that. Hallelujah. You have the ability to praise God and talk about how good He is so you can know on the inside that my God is big. Praise God. But it's through repetition. Yes. The key is having great faith. The key to having great faith is having a great big God. Yeah. It's not me. I'm not self-sufficient. I'm I'm trusting in my God. Right. Yes. My God's a big yeah. God. Yes, right. Amen. What you choose to believe is up to you. Yes. This is what must be altered. Just as in every other other endeavor, little by little, we increase our belief in yes. God by recognizing what He's done. Thanking Him for it and praising His greatness. Right. Praise God. Everything that you do, if you if you are a weightlifter, you go to the gym and you begin to pump some iron. And you know that it's not just simply one time pumping that iron and your arms are going to pop up and you're going to walk out of the gym <laughs> like Superman. You have to do it every day. You have to do it repetitiously. Yes, sir. And see, praising God is the same way. Right. See, you, yes. you, you, you can't come to church and just be silent. No, Hallelujah. No, when you come to a place yes. where we're worshiping yes. God, you have to let your right. voice be known. Right. In your own private right. time, when it's just you and God, right. you have to praise God. Yes. You know why? Because what this is doing for you, it's helping you out. Right. It's ensconching. Right. It's writing something on your hard drive. Yes. It's writing yes. something yes. on that place that's subconscious. Yes. So that when you're encountering a problem in your right. life, that faith jumps forward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. David said it like this in Psalms 107 and 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yes. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. When God blesses you, you need to make a big deal. It's not, it's, it's never too big a deal to make of what God has done for you. Because you're staunching on the hard drive how good, how great, how faithful our God is. Hallelujah. And God wants you to do that. Hallelujah. It's helping you to have faith in God. It's helping you to get a big God concept. Hallelujah. Amen. And look at all the revelations God had given John. He remarked about this. This is the thing that, that Mark John said about how they overcame through the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Your testimony, your praising God, your thanking God about what He's done in your life isn't just a help to you. It's not just writing something on your subconscious, on your hard drive, on your mainframe, right. but it's helping somebody else to grab a hold of that information. Their ears are yes. hearing it, and it's helping right. their heart yes. to believe yes. God. It's helping their heart to see God. Yes. It's helping them to have a big God mentality. Right. Totally. Yes. Praise yes. God. You have to open your mouth. You have to be willing to yes. shout. You have to be willing to dance. You have to be willing to celebrate the goodness of the Lord, because this is how we overcome. Yes. This is how we Yes, amen. When you celebrate his goodness, you're yeah. preaching. Right. And you're speaking directly into your yes. subconscious. That's right, amen. 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 Praise God. Jesus. Amen. You're making a memorial. That's right. And you're making a memory of the yes. celebration in your subconscious. Something for you to revert back to mm -hmm. when your heart 
is overwhelmed. Yes. yes. Praise God. Rather than going and grabbing the gun, rather than going and thinking about hanging yourself, slitting your wrist, cutting your throat, or whatever other thing that may come to your mind to end your life, when you get God on the inside, that's, that's, those kind of thoughts won't surface because you have seen God is so big. Maybe it's bigger than me. Maybe it overwhelms me. Maybe it's too hard for me to do anything about. Maybe it's so big for me. But I have a God that's very big. I have a God that's very hard. I have a God that's into you and seen abundantly above all that I can ask or think. I have a big God. Hallelujah. The key to having a big God is to lifting him higher, making him stronger, more powerful by far, lofty, worthy, hallelujah, magnificent, enhancing your view of God by making a big deal about what he does. David says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah. There's something about exalting his name. Praise is an expression of warm approval or admiration of. Yes. Hallelujah. Honor, Lord God. Honor, hallelujah. hallelujah. You know, praise is calling God names. It invites the presence of God. El Shaddai is a name in the Old Testament. He was called, it means Lord God Almighty. El Elyon, the Most High God. Adonai, Lord Master. Yahweh, Lord Jehovah. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord Ra is the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. Jehovah Sidney, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Mekadish, the Lord who sanctifies. El Oim, the, the everlasting God. Elohim, God. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Hallelujah. Jehovah Shadow, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Sabiach, the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. In the Old Testament, when God did something, they called his name by the action that he performed. Hallelujah. And we have to do the same thing. My God's a big God. He's a healer. Hallelujah. He's a deliverer. He's a savior. Hallelujah. Praise God. Worship is the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for deity. Worship allows God to work internally. God, I praise Hallelujah. God, hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I do when you worship. praise God, you're yes. preaching to yourself. Yes. I do hallelujah. Worship. Praise God. If I can if I can say anything today that's gonna, gonna be a lasting thought, something that's gonna be ensconced in your memory from this sermon, just remember this. That when you praise God, you are preaching to yourself. When you praise God, you're telling yourself how good God is. When you praise God, you're enhancing your belief. You're enhancing your core understanding. Hallelujah. You're putting something there for your default. When my heart is overwhelmed, David says, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. Hallelujah. You'll start looking for that rock when you believe he's there. When you believe he's powerful. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I do worship. We react to what our senses pick up. It's the data from our senses that tells our brain what's happening. How to process it. How to assess it. When you praise, you're going against the normal flow of things. Enter into a realm where you are preaching a message that's being encoded into your subconscious that God is whatever you need him to be. However big, however powerful, however your praises declare him to be. Hallelujah. Praise and worship goes past your senses into your subconscious, forming the foundation of your core belief. Hallelujah. The more you praise God, the more you will believe his power is greater. Yes. As you renew your mind or rewrite the program of your subconscious. I will thank you, Lord. You know, since you were young, you were taught what to believe, what to fear. Hallelujah. We all, you know, you don't have to really go too far before a child is afraid of the dark. Praise God. Whatever's been preached into your core will determine your response to the data your senses are picking up. What's happening in your life? Hallelujah. What's there is going to cause your response. The big God that you've been boasting about is who you turn to with expectation. And he will show up when the enemy comes in like a flood. Hallelujah. It happens faster than your conscious mind can analyze and respond to. Praise sings a message deep within our being. As to the awesomeness of our God. Hallelujah. Every time we do it, it gives us the ability to automatically 
go to it when we're overwhelmed. Hallelujah. And you know, life, the Bible says, man is born of woman a few days and full of trouble. Yeah. Every life sees trouble. Every life sees obstacles. Every life sees things that cause you fear. Makes you want to back up. God. Worshippers preach to themselves simultaneously as they magnify God yes. and make Him bigger and more powerful. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. David spoke of writing God's law on the tables of his heart. Yes. It helps to convince us of God's greatness. Right. Mm -hmm. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes. We must be reminded when we praise God, we strengthen our resolve about His greatness. Right. Mm -hmm. When you're not afraid to cry out because you know He hears you, That's right. you'll see Him do great things. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11, 6 says, He that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder yes. of them that diligently mm -hmm. seek Him. Yes. yes. Here's five yeah. reasons why we need to have a big God mentality. Okay. God, praise God. Sure. Five you. reasons. We have no idea what tomorrow holds. That's right. Hallelujah. But he does. Yes, he does. Amen. He's the ever-existing one. The Bible says in Revelations 1 and I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. I am the Almighty. Right. Hallelujah. Yes. Second, there's no end to his knowledge. Great is our Lord and great of power. Great of power. His understanding is infinite. Psalms 147 and 5. We cannot reason on his plane. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of all the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching his understanding. Isaiah 40 and 28. He has no equal. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring yes. the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. He calls those things that are not as though they are. He tells you what he's going to do and he says nothing can stop me. Hallelujah. Second reason is that we need hope. We need hope. He is dependable. Hallelujah. Expectation. David says, my soul waited, my soul wait thou upon, only upon God. For my, expe my expectation, rather, is from him. Psalm 62 and 5. The Lord is our hope. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, Amen. whose hope the Lord is. Jeremiah 17 and 7. He has a plan for you. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. That's the God that we serve. Those are the thoughts you've got to put on the inside. Those are the things you've got to remind yourself about your God. Hallelujah. Amen. Number three, life is full of trouble. Yes. Trouble comes suddenly. Man is born a few days of a woman and full of trouble. God is our defense and he's our offense. God is my refuge and my strength. A very present help in the time of trouble. When you cry, he hears you. This poor man, as in our text, cried unto the Lord and he heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Psalms 34 and 6. Hallelujah. The fourth reason is there is a devil. But we are overcomers. Yes. Amen. Praise God. First John 4 and 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have yes. overcome them. Because greater is he that's within you yes. than he that's within yes. the world. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. We always win. Now thanks be unto God, 2 Corinthians 4, 2 and 14, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make him manifest the savor of his knowledge in, by us in every place. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8 and 28. No matter what he tries, it won't work. That's right. Amen. Praise God. No matter what the devil tries, it won't work right. if you don't allow it to. Because right. right. he can overwhelm you. Yeah. But if there's something on the inside, right. if you've been praising your God, if you've been preaching to yourself about how big your yes. God is, yes. Hallelujah. it won't work. Yeah. Isaiah 54 and 17 says, No yes. weapon formed against me shall prosper. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Every tongue that rises up against thee in judgment shall be condemned. This is the heritage of the saints, the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of, is of me, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. And number five, we need a Savior. Yes. Amen. He yes. loved us with great Amen. love right. and came down to our level. Isaiah 9 and 6 lets us know that for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, 
counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, gave us power to become the sons of God. John 1 and 11 through 13 says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Yes. He personally sacrificed for us, yes. neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, even as I as well. Praise God. Every day, we need to start our day with a simultaneous practice of praising him. Hallelujah. And reminding ourselves of how great he is. Hallelujah. Yes. This is how we prepare for the challenges of the day. Yes, Lord. When you have a big God that's greater than any circumstances, you're beginning to think like David. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, David had no idea what he was going to face. His dad just came to him and said, listen, I want you to take some provisions to your brothers. But God had a plan for delivering Israel. Yeah. You see, Israel had camped on a mountain and on the other mountain, the Philistines had come across the border. And the Bible says they were, they were set to put the battle in the rain. In other words, they were about to fight several times. But every time they got ready to fight, the Philistines sent out this champion of theirs. And he said, let's do something a little different here. You guys send one guy down and let him fight with me, and the winner will win for both sides. And when they saw this guy, they were afraid of him. David had no idea what was about to happen. He just went there. His dad told him to go. All the soldiers were there. But God, I believe God handpicked him. God did this. God worked on the situation. Sometimes things seem like they're so unconnected. Right, right, right. But that's how God works. He coordinates yes, things. That's right. Hallelujah. Yes. He knows how to bring things together. Yes, he and, does. And, and, and Jesse having the idea that particular day yes. to call David and say, out of the fields, from watching the sheep. Yes. And to tell him to take that food up to his brothers. That was the hand of God. Yes, it was. Because yes. they yes. were in a stalemate with yes. the Philistines. Everybody was afraid. God gave somebody else a chance to be the champion, but they were all afraid. The Bible says they all ran into their tents. There's always a reason why not. But when you have a big God, none of them matter. That's right. Praise God. God had a plan to deliver them. He made all of this and he can change any of it. Yes, he can. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. David came to this situation. And the Bible says that when he got there, he came to where the armies were. He got there and all of a sudden he saw this man come up and challenge Israel. And Israel scattered. David didn't once pronounce any kind of fear. David was totally unafraid. Why? There was, a, there was an automated response, a challenge that was so big that had all his brothers that were in the army running like everybody else and afraid into their tent. Even Saul ran to his tent. Right. He sees this. He witnesses this. You see, what your eyes show you, you believe more than anything else. That's right. That's right. Even sometimes more than things you hear. That's right. What you see with your eyes is the strong, it, puts a, it makes a very strong impression. But here's David, he comes to the scene and he sees everybody scattered. Everybody who's supposed to be a champion. Everybody who has a reputation. You know, Saul had a reputation. We find that out after David did his mighty act and people began to sing songs about David. But they first sang songs about Saul. Yeah. Saul had done some exploits before. Yeah. Before he got twisted up with God, he had done some things. Yes. God had used him great and mightily to bring victory to Israel. But all those people that were champions, that had a great reputation, none of that mattered. They all ran to their tent, scared. Yes. And David came to the scene where he saw that. What could have prepared him for that? What could have prepared him for coming there with his countrymen? Yes. The people that were there to protect the country. Yes. All running in fear. David was bold as a... Was David braggadocious on himself? No. The Bible says that the righteous are bold as a lion. Yes. And it's because they're not depending on themselves. They're depending on their God. Yes. Hallelujah. And David certainly was. David, here's the challenge. And he says, who's this guy challenging? This uncircumcised. He 
automatically said this. And it wasn't a derogatory thing as much as it was a covenant thing. This guy's out. See, David was so immersed in God. He says, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? He's out of covenant. I'm linked to God because I have a covenant. I, I, I've been circumcised. And I'm linked to God because I have a covenant with God. Who is this guy who's not even in covenant with God? Who does he think he is? He has no power. Because David understood that what was behind him. Yes, I'm a little scrawny boy. Praise God. But there's power behind me. There's power. Hallelujah. There's power behind me. Hallelujah. There's power behind me. Hallelujah. To change that situation. There's power behind me. Hallelujah. And David came up to that situation and they gave it into David's hands. After some fuss, his brother said, you know, they thought he was just being, you know, braggadocious, but, yeah. but Saul found out there was somebody out there with faith. Yes. Saul didn't have you, but somebody was talking about how great God was. Yes. Yes. And Saul wanted to hear that. Because yes. yes. he knew about the power of God. Right. And so soon enough, he calls David in. He tries to put David's armor in him. It doesn't work. David goes to challenge Goliath. He goes out there, and he's not afraid at all. Listen, he's looking at this giant now. You know, from a distance is one thing. But now to be up on the giant's face. But David was never going in David's ability. And that's what we have to realize. You're not going to face from your ability. You don't know what tomorrow holds. So that's why you have to praise God today. That's why you got to convince yourself today about how great God is. And you got to praise Him. You got to talk to Him because you're preaching to yourself. You're preaching to yourself. When you tell God how good He is, when you get to praise and thank and magnify Him, hallelujah, David says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Because when you magnify him, you make God big. Hallelujah. To you. You're worthy, God. You're worthy of all honor and glory, Lord God. When you face situations that would normally cause you to run into your tent, because you've been thinking about how big your God is, since you've been telling yourself how big your God is, it doesn't even matter. David says, I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. Yes. Right. Yeah, I got a sling, but he never mentioned the sling. He says, I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. You're coming to me with all these carnal things, and that's great, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. That's, that's why I'm going to be victorious. He talked trash to David, and David talked trash right back to him. Because he knew about his God. Hey, that know their God will be mighty and do exploits. You know, there's somebody else that had a big God mentality. The little maid at Naaman's house had a big God mentality. Having never seen a leper healed before. Having never seen a leper cured before. This little girl, taken captive, hallelujah, began to tell her captors, about a big God. She's going to tell her captains about a big God that's able to do something that she never saw done before, never heard of it being done before. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, weren't there many lepers in, in, in Israel during the time of Naaman and none of them were healed? So she never saw a leper healed. How did she get a big God mentality like that? Having never seen that kind of miracle take place, Praise God. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Amen. And she just thought it like this. She says, my God's able. doesn't matter what it is. Cancer, you know, leprosy, whatever it is. God is able. Amen. And that's what, that's what a big God mentality will do. But the only way you get a big God mentality is when you worship God, when you praise Him, when you magnify Him, when you dance before Him, when you praise God's name. Hallelujah. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what tomorrow's going to be like. I'm going to praise God today. Because when I'm praising God today, I'm preaching to myself about how big my God is, about how good my God is. When I face a situation that overwhelms me, all I can do is revert back to that default position about how big my God is. Hallelujah. Peter had a big God mentality. After being on the, oh, the, the water all that night, thinking he was going to die and the rest of them. The Bible says that when he saw Jesus, they feared him. But then Peter said, even though I'm afraid, I'm scared. David says, at what time I'm afraid I'm going to trust in God? Yeah. Peter says, 
Jesus, if that's you, call me. Tell me to come. He probably would never have ever thought like that. But he did at that point. And Jesus says, come. And he's just jumped out of the boat and started walking on water. Praise God. He had a big God mentality. Hallelujah. He's the first to ever exercise miraculous power that the Holy Ghost gave him in healing the man at the gate beautiful. You know, I don't know if it takes 10,000 hours of practice. I don't know if that's the number. But we're told to pray without ceasing. Yes. And part of your right. prayer needs to be praising to God. Right. Hallelujah. Right. And it's just not empty rhetoric when you talk about how great God is. When you're telling him, God, you are great. When you make a big deal, when you're, you're not ashamed. David, dance before the Lord. The Bible says David, dance before the Lord. Wasn't, a, wasn't ashamed. His wife is so upset at him. You embarrass me today, David. And David just simply said, wait until next time. <laughs> yeah. oh, There's something that David got a hold of that his wife didn't understand. Because he got a hold of that thing before he ever got married. While he was watching those sheep, yes. they even knew something about praising God. Yes. He understood yes. something about yes. how important it was to praise yes. God. Yes. How important it was yes. to magnify yes. God. Because yes. it put something yes. on the mainframe of his life. Yes. It put something down on his hard drive. Hallelujah. Yes. When the yes. obstacles yes. came. Yes. And it caused David to revert God. back to that. I got a big God. God. I can handle it. I got a big God. God. It's not too big. Lord. I got a big God. Hallelujah. That's able to do it. See abundantly above all that I can ask you to think. Praise God. I will praise you. David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. David had made it a practice. He had made it a practice. I'm going to praise God. All the time. When I'm happy, I'm going to praise it. When I'm sad, I'm going to praise it. When I'm in between, I'm going to praise it. Because what he was doing is telling himself he was storing something up for the day of trouble. He was storing something up for the day of adversity. He was storing something up for when opposition came against him. I, I, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to say how big he is so that big God can surface in my life. So that big God can surface when situations have me Amen. in a place where I begin to worry. Yes. Hallelujah. Let's stand today. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got to have a big God mentality. We've got to have a big God mentality. And the only way you get a big God mentality, the only way you get a big God mentality is if you praise him. If you preach to yourself. David, the Bible says, he had gone to Ziklag. He has been living in Ziklag. They were returning home from a battle they couldn't fight in. And the Bible says, as his men approached the place, they saw smoke. And so they probably hurried up on their way there. When they got to there, their worst fears were confirmed. Nobody was there. Everything was smoldering. And the Bible says that the men cried, including David, until they couldn't cry anymore. But David was off and separate from them. He started hearing the men talk about killing him. And the Bible says that David was afraid, exceedingly afraid, because his men who he had trained, who were back their leader in most cases, now were coming unglued with the notion of even killing David. And the Bible says what David did with that situation. What David did with that situation that he had never faced before. He faced Goliath. He faced Saul, ran from Saul, and watched God work in miraculous ways. But now his own men were turning against him. He had never faced that before. He'd never been in that position before. But the Bible says that David went into default mode. He began to encourage himself in the Lord. I don't know exactly what David said, but I know the content. I know the general content of what David was saying. He was saying, my God is bigger. My God is stronger. Hallelujah. My God is able. My God sees where these people are at, where our people have gone, where they've been taken. God knows. 
And it wasn't too long after that David called for the priest. Bring the ephod. Bring the ephod. And his question shows you what was on his mind. Hallelujah. David says, shall we pursue? Shall we pursue? And the voice came back from the Lord. Pursue. And you shall recover all. David had a big God mentality. Sometimes we think, well, it's, too, it's, 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 a, it's a lost cause. It's all over. It's not even worth praying about. It's not even worth talking to God about anymore. But David says, yes, it looks like everything's destroyed. It looks like everything's burnt. It looks like there's no use for me to put the effort forward. But David began to encourage himself in the Lord. And I'm going to tell you right now, you've got to begin to encourage yourself in the Lord. When my heart is overwhelmed, David said, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've got to have a big God mentality. And the way you get a big God mentality is when you're willing to praise God. When you're willing to do it when you don't feel like it. When you're willing to, to spend your waking hours, hallelujah, like David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah. I'm going to bless him. 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 Hallelujah. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah. Because as I'm praising him with my mouth, I'm also preaching a message to my subconscious. I'm actually storing something in the core of who I am. Hallelujah. I, I'm actually manipulating my default mode. I'm actually manipulating my autonomous mode. And so when I go into that default mode, when I go into autopilot, what's there is going to come out. Great is my God. Yes, the problem is big, but my God is big. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Oh, hallelujah.